Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I know we are from different parts of the world on this platform. Uh, I welcome you all to this Horasis Asia Meet and this particular special panel. Uh, my name is Neeraj Charan. I'm the chairman of Aura. I'm going to be honored to be your moderator for this panel today. And uh, Frank Richter has actually made my life very, very nice because he's cherry picked such high domain knowledge leaders, a few from around the world that I'm going to take, sit back and listen, take some nuggets and, and enjoy doing this panel. Uh, as you know, the subject for today is the next big global issues and the relevance for Asia. And we have a structure, we'll have this conversation to, uh, after this. So I welcome all of you. I welcome Parag from Janajal, Professor Ivan, Alec, Panav, and Mr. Armin. So welcome to this panel. Uh, you know, I think I'm just going to throw some teaser things here for you guys to churn and come back to me with these things. I believe, truly, I believe it, we are at one of those K, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, whatever will be moments. Uh, you know, will it be the rise of the fragmented, you know, geopolitical and rise of nationalism that we look all around? Will it be the geopolitical and trade war that's going on between China, US and other countries that kind of joining in on either side of the flank? Would it be, you know, the climate change? Would it be the massive billion uh, migration that is expected by 2030? You know, will it be uh, inequality that is now accentuated more at this time than ever before? Because during COVID time, the inequality has been playing nakedly all around the world. Or would it be the changing consumerism that Asia is going to see in the future? Because they expect that by 2030, uh, almost 60% of the middle class consumption of the world is going to be brought in by Asia. Would it be AI? Would it be Internet of Things? Would it be healthcare? Would it be water? I leave that to my very cherished panelists to respond to that. Before I go in, I just wanted to make one small observation that in my life, it's probably the first time that I've seen that in a world-class crisis that we have seen, America has not been a response leader to this pandemic. Has not been. If at all, it has mismanaged this, this crisis. Is that a reflection of what is going to be in the future? Or are we going to see some correction there? It's the first time I've seen. So we are living in a different world. With this, I go to my first panelist, uh, Dr. Parag Agrawal. He's the chairman of Janajal, and he's got over 30 years experience in entrepreneurship. I know you founded Janajal in 2013 as a social enterprise around water. Uh, in the last seven years, it's grown to a very, very strong position with uh, facilities and operations in Singapore, India, and Dubai. And I know you have two very unique things that you've done at Janajal. I'd like to pick on that. One is the the, the concept of water on wheels at Janajal. And the way you say you Uberize the water service at Janajal. So that's a very important thing. Since you're from that domain, my first question to you is water still remains, no matter what, even after four decades. Water still remains is one of the biggest challenges faced in the world. How do you scale and volume this problem, especially after this pandemic? That's my first question to you, Parag. To you. Two minutes, if you can summarize that. Thank you. Thank you, Neeraj. It's a, it's a pleasure and privilege to be speaking here. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's very well put. You know, we're talking about the next big global issues, but, you know, what about the issues that have been carried forward forever? And, uh, you know, we, for one, uh, live our life underwater, as I say, because that's the prism through which we look at the world. And, you know, I, um, it, it's a problem that must start getting addressed. I mean, I'm not going to say must get solved because it's not something that, that can be solved by any entity or any, any one generation also. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to take three generations to probably to attempt to, or to dream to solve it. But it must be attended to. It must be looked at. And I think really speaking, uh, in our own little way, we've kind of created a format, we've created a vision under which we are acting to try and address the problem in its own little way, in our own little way. 
uh, you mentioned the Janjal Wow, and thank you for doing that. I am very pleased to submit and and update here uh, everyone here that only three four days ago, the government of India has actually selected Janjal Wow as an innovation and a technology to implement the world's largest drinking water project in India, which is a fifty billion. Dollar uh, implementation over the next four years by 2024, and Janjal Wow is one of five technologies that is that has made the cut. So it's a huge it's a huge validation vindication of what we have seen, what we've envisioned, and the understanding of the entire uh, of the understanding of the problem on the ground. India is a beast that is very difficult to cage when it comes to water. Uh, it's very very it's as difficult as trying to put water in a cage. Uh, it's always going to flow out. And similarly, uh, you know, the, the 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 problem is so complex. The problem is so diverse. And I think the world at large needs to start looking at this and attending to this in a very granular manner, in a, at a very micro level. Each one will have to do their little bit um, and uh, you know address the issues. Uh, I think I, I've probably come up to my time, but uh, you know, I will speak more uh, in, in the rest of the panel. But but yes, privilege to be here. I, I, thank you, thank you, Parag. Thank you for your first uh, thoughts on this matter. We'll come back to you. Hold on to your thoughts on all of this water. Yeah, I could I'll speak move, for our, so, so you yeah, know. I, Pranav, I move to Pranav, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Petronas Lubricants, based out of Mumbai, and he's an experienced CEO of, of 20 years in the downstream oil and gas sector. He's been involved in many complex turnarounds, and he specializes uh, in strategic consulting. PL management, you've got digital transformation, and you've got experience around Asia, China, and Asian countries. So, you know, and today we're, everyone's talking about the rapid use of digitization, automation, artificial intelligence, social impact in Asia. We're talking in Asia because of this. So, how has the current pandemic impacted this trend that we were seeing anyway? Maybe that's the first uh, thoughts that I may want to ask from you, Pranav. Sure. Thanks, Neeraj, and uh, privilege to be here. So I'll, I'll, I'll get straight to the question. Um, I think automation, digitization is actually this this avalanche and waiting, as I see it, uh, because it has two dimensions. One is the good side of it, and then the other is the impact of it. Uh, so you know, in the last six or seven months, there's been a lot of talk about how a lot of companies want to automate quicker, faster, a lot of stuff that they want to do, which was never there before on the table. And I see that around, you know, we're accelerating a lot of initiatives. But a couple of stats I just wanted to put out there, and I, I picked up this study by WEF very recently. And these stats are quite startling. So number one, 85 million jobs will go away in 2020, by 2025 because of this rapid AI, rapid automation, rapid digitization. By 2025, we will have 50-50 split between humans and machine in terms of the jobs. And last but not the least, 50% of the employees will have to be reskilled in order to keep them into the jobs. So this is a little bit of the dark side of automation. I think the positive side we see everywhere on LinkedIn, on all these disruptors who we you know, deify and say these guys are doing brilliant stuff. But what's the impact on the other side? Uh, it's it's really uh, would be a good topic to sort of you know look at, and I think these are the forums where we need to explore. Uh, just a couple of things before I pause here. Uh, you know, COVID has actually accelerated all this. I think we are all aware that the stuff that was not on the table has suddenly come onto the boardrooms and suddenly come into the discussions. And in Singapore, also there was this. They started this Kopi Kopi Tiam Cafe, which is doing. The barista is completely a robot. So there is no old lady or old uncle actually mixing your kopi or whatever. So, you know, this stuff is real. Where the, the automation of this second wave is actually going to these areas which were very much labor intensive, which were basic stuff uh, um, and, and basic industries. So more on this later, Neera, when we come back in this. In this. Thank but you. But these are my opening thoughts. Thank you, Pranav. Thank you. Avalanche and waiting. I'll pick up on that word later. Uh, the avalanche invading. I go to Armin. Um, he is a, uh, a bachelor's from uh, UCLA, California, and is an uh, MA and a PhD from Claremont University. And uh, he's a founder, member, and CEO of the uh, Foundation for Armenian Science and Technology. It's a nonprofit. 
that uh, enhances intellectual, financial, and network capacities in science and technology in Armenia and around the world. I know that FAST, uh, your, your, uh, the setup that you have, has launched several uh, startup and accelerator programs, incubator programs, uh, especially on artificial intelligence, biotech, robotics, AI, machine language. All that we are talking today is very relevant. So uh, I'm going to ask you a truly a trillion dollar question, or maybe a couple of trillion dollar question all in one line. And that is, can artificial intelligence be used to predict the next global crisis and not only predict, but also prevent them before they happen? Because we talk AI all the time. Your thoughts on this, Armin? Uh, you're, you're muted, Armin. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. Um, interesting question, right? Today, probably not. AI uh, cannot predict as to what the next uh, big major global crisis uh, will be. Um, AI is uh, very intelligent and not at the same time. Uh, in, in the areas that it has uh, a great vertical depth, uh, you know, uh, for instance, uh, what uh, Google DeepMind uh, Alpha Zero has created, it has an incredible uh, vertical depth. Um, there is not a human on the planet, not a human out of the 107 billion humans that walked uh, on the face of planet that will come close to its intellectual uh, capability and capacity. However, uh, its vertical depth is not complemented horizontally. It still doesn't know in order for you to make hummus, you need chickpeas, for instance. It still needs to learn simple things of that nature. It's, so I would I would say, you know, uh, Parag was saying about 2025, 2035. I would suspect by 2035, probably uh, in the next uh, 10, 15 years, we will be able to have artificial intelligence that would that would start reasoning uh, closer to human reasoning in in all the verticals not only in singular vertical but we have ways to go okay. uh, but next major uh, crisis so the second part of your I think we have some network issues with Armin. You are not audible at this time. Uh, so we'll move right now. He's going to come back. I'll move to Professor Ivan. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Uh, professor Ivan is the professor and faculty of Dean at Niigata University, Japan. We'll be um, by 2025. Uh, okay, we, we're back to uh, Armin. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Armin. Sorry, we lost you for like 10 seconds. Go ahead. Oh, all right. So I, I wanted to come back what uh, uh, Pranav was saying that by 2035, uh, we we uh, we are going to have 50% of the population that needs to be reskilled, for instance. Well, you know, in order for properly reskilling, what do we need? Uh, we need uh, uh, education and uh, we need uh, depth of education. And today, when we look around the world, um, you know, we identify some countries that are leading in the educational space, but they're leading with the traditional instruments, with the traditional uh, education that was around for 400 years. Uh, the world of the future requires a different type of an approach. And I think we as humans, we haven't figured this out. You know, we have leaders in Singapore, in Finland, and what have you, but I think there are ways off as to what the education of the world that we're expecting that's going to be AI field that should look like. And I'm hoping that AI will help us uh, design both on the curriculum side, uh, but also in the infrastructure type of a setup that will be required for us to teach our kids starting from K to all the way to 12 and beyond uh, how and what is required for us to learn for us not to get to 2035 and wait to be re-skilled, but be, be properly uh, educated for us to be able to get into socioeconomic activities immediately. I'll stop here. So I'll, uh, Thank you. Others. Thank you, Armin. Uh, there is a little bit of static coming out. So if someone can, if all of us can go to mute uh, when we are not speaking. Yeah, that's better now. 
Uh, I Sorry, uh, Professor Ivan, I'll continue from where I left last time that uh, you specialize in international and Asian economy. You have the, you've been the author of some best-selling books. I'd love to take a copy of that and read it. Um, okay. your, uh, the, you know, the, the, your book for best-selling book, Asia's Turning Point in 2009. Yes. And uh, China versus the West. Now, that is something I'd love to take a copy and read, China versus the West, which you wrote in 2012. And, and uh, Professor Ivan has been a regular uh, columnist and writer at Oxford Analytics, um, CNBC, French Press, Cambridge. So my first question to you, Professor uh, Ivan, is what is your diagnosis for Asia, especially in the Asian economies under this current pandemic, since this is an Asia meet? Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pleasure to be here. Well, uh, the Asian economy is in the worst shape since its high growth story began. For the first time ever, actually all Asian economies have slid into very low, if not negative growth, China including. And you've mentioned Kesara Sarah when you started the session. I'll quote yeah. another song from Elvis Presley, which says, we're caught in a trap. I can't walk out. And so on and so on. So here's a trap. It's kind of a vicious cycle. We have a low mobility economy, stay home pattern, insane economy. Low mobility economy leads to demand constraints due to falling or stalled consumption. Next step, it smashes tertiary industries. Next step, employment situation worsening, incomes falling. Next step, Demand constraint, and on and on. Well, uh, sales grow in some sectors. Virtual world, IT-related industries, video games, home deliveries. But, but this does not make up for the demand squeeze I have been talking about. And as an economist, I am concerned about Asia's ability to restore growth. Actually, this process of economic growth and process of development as such is at stake. Stakes are very high. So let me very, be very simple at the end of this small talk. Growth is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you for those words and the nuggets. We'll get back on that because it's very relevant to what you said. I move to Alec Wong, who is the founder and president of Tana Investment Group in San Francisco, California. You've been an entrepreneur for a long time, an investor. Uh, I know that your uh, primary domain was in the uh, uh, real estate industry, but your passion around energy issues, climate change, sustainability, through the investments that you make and through the uh, mentorship that you provide to your investment companies, and your donor role and your volunteer role in nonprofit allows you to play this widespread role. And, uh, you know, my question is, how did we really arrive at this pathetic situation that we've seen in the last nine months and, and which is affecting our life, our livelihood, our future? And, and, and what prevents us from changing course? Because there is something is preventing. What is preventing us from changing course? and make this fundamental change. Thank you, Naraj. It's my honor to be here. And that's a very in-depth question. And uh, um, I thought about how to attack such a wide uh, subject. Yeah, there are so many issues we have on hand from those related to nature, like climate change, to uh, societal and humanitarian um, issues like inequality you mentioned at the beginning. Um, you know, COVID-19 really prompted us to take drastic actions towards, um, uh, in, the, in the global scale, like nothing else did in recent history. A lot of the actions we um, adopted were not popular or controversial in, in many ways, but we still follow them because there is a sense of um, danger and imminent harm to either our health or uh, our societal stability. Things like uh, restrictions to our business activities, to travel, um, or fiscal spending that was not agreeable to everybody. But to a large degree, 
we still follow them uh, because of those concerns. So um, I thought to address the issues that um, we have, even if it's not one specific one, um, we do have to adopt a similar approach, um, which is number one, we do have to recognize the urgencies of many of these matters from climate change to inequality, water crises, et cetera, and stop pretending that problems don't exist just because the harms they bring are not imminent to us. Um, and then we have to also find the ways to f change some fundamental beliefs, mindsets, and narratives in our society so our priorities and practices can be better aligned with resolving these issues rather than further aggravating them. What that means is a lot of the things that we are used to from setting economic goals to how do we spend public spending, what industries do we subsidize, to even consumer behavior and, and the preferences have to be challenged in a way. And um, I think that would be the angle I'd like to use to um, approach our discussion. So maybe I'll spend a little bit more time in the next round to, um, yeah, to, to tackle these. Thank you, Alec. That's a good teaser point about not living in denial, but to accept where we are and come up with some answers in that. So back to Parag, back to the water domain that uh, I know there is a, there is an aspect of Janajal, which is about delivery, but I believe that uh, there is a overreaching, far deeper, larger perspective at play here. And the reason I'm asking this question is because most businesses have a, uh, what is visible to the eye, but then there's a larger purpose which actually navigates that business far deeper into the success zone. So how, did, how have you brought in this purpose apart from the transactional thing into, uh, into the successful story of Jan Agile? Because that's a kind of a story that can be picked up in many businesses. Not, it's agnostics. It's not, you know, you can go into any business for that matter. You're muted, uh, Parag, you're muted. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very, 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 very uh, uh, pertinent. Um, so for us, you know, while as the world sees it, uh, safe water, drinking water is a product and it is it is what we sell or what we make available to people. For <coughs> us, internally, it has always been a medium of change. It has always been a medium of conveying a, or, or delivering a constellation of benefits, as we call it. And there is a series of um, the benefits which when put together, it all adds up to impact. And that is exactly what has been the driving force behind this. So, you know, I mean, people talk of a, of a triple P bottom line. We speak of a, of, a, of a four P bottom line, which is purpose, climate, people and profit. So while we remain for profit and, you know, uh, Profiting is not a bad word. Profiteering is. So, you know, very often people mix up the two words and they equate them with each other. But it's important to remain profitable, to remain lean, to remain very, very effective, to remain extremely output oriented. And that is something that has really helped us immensely. That's the position we took very early up front and it has helped us and, and held us in good stead. So, the, the, the benefits, the overarching benefits could be elimination of single-use plastic, job creation, creation of social entrepreneurs, women empowerment, uh, upskilling and skill development, you know, basically rendering training and, the, uh, and of course, health, wellness, prosperity, economic stimulation. You know, so economies can get stimulated. I mean, there have, been, there have been articles by some very wise men which say every dollar that goes into, uh, into a drinking water project can uh, can yield up to twelve dollars of ROI on, uh, when it comes to assessing the impact and quantifying it. We did that ourselves recently, and we discovered that as a company, we've delivered more than five point five billion dollars of impact when quantified. And that was a third-party assessment report, and we, it took us it blew our minds away in terms of you know what we had achieved. Because sometimes you're like a woodpecker; you're just pecking away at the trunk without knowing what what it's actually looking like from the outside. So. Yeah, uh, it's very, very, it's very, very overarching and extremely impactful. Thank you, Parag. That's uh, uh, the profit uh, versus profiteering. I'm going to carry that uh, word for a future. Uh, back to Pranav, uh, since we are talking again back to digitization and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, 
you know, all this impact and the trends that we see around, the, what is the uh, impact of job creation and job security, which we are all talking about? Uh, call it the gray side, the dark side, the negative, the positive, whichever side you, whichever way you slice and dice it. But there is a direct impact on job and job creation and job security. What are your thoughts on this because of the trends that we see? So I think you, you, it, it's a very, very pertinent question because uh, job displacement is, is one of the biggest impacts that will be seen, which I believe would be in Asia. Again, I'll throw some numbers. Uh, pardon me if I for throwing numbers, but actually gives a perspective. Because this digitization, if you look at key sectors of Asia, like auto sector, mining, consumer finance, we are looking at a displacement of anything between 17 to 20% of jobs. And these are the heartbeat sectors of Asia. And along with it, I mean, Asia, again, is, is a kind of a, is kind of a different setup because we have a lot of what we call as a vulnerable employment in Asia, which means that the people that are employed are either through informal means, informal sectors, so they may not have a proper contractual protection, etc. And it means in India, we have 74% of vulnerable employment. Indonesia, about 50%. Uh, you know, Thailand, about 45 percent. So this, when, when you put these things, to, two things together, the, the, the real gray side of automation, so you look at the impact on the heartbeat sectors, and I think Professor mentioned earlier, I think the by selling Sony PS5, I don't think you're going to make up for the job loss on auto sector, mining sector, oil and gas, because that's where you get people, uh, the low skilled people there. You keep them in busy in the day work and you don't let them go away and do some naughty things on the road. So this cocktail, as I put it now, so you'll have a cocktail of three things. You'll have a, a 50 percent job loss, which I mentioned, going into the heart of the sectors of Asia auto mining, oil and gas, financial services. And then we have a vulnerable employment, which means that the people getting displaced may not necessarily have the right sort of a pathway which, which Aryan was mentioning you know, to get reskilled or retooled or you know get re reabsorbed somewhere. So put three things together, I think you know the, the next big issue, and as I said, I will launch and wait, it could be a real bad cocktail of all these things. Thank I'll you. pause here. We'll come back later on. I think there are good thoughts which Professor and I, I, I have mentioned in terms of, you know, what can be done to, to resolve it, but we, we'll keep it for later. Thank you, uh, Prana. We'll get back to you on this point. I go to uh, Armin. Uh, 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 how, do you act, how do you rate the, uh, you know, the emergent Asia on the world innovation map, you know? Uh, Asia is uh, getting onto the world innovation map. And, and how do you rate that? And how do you think it's strength and weakness at this point on, on the innovation part of Asian role on the world map? Um, excellent question. You know, Asia is, is quite vast. So, you know, we probably need to uh, segment it into, into parts. Um, you know, if if we take uh, this single country here, we take China has become a giant when it comes to innovation. Uh, but they've spent over 30 years on on trying to excel in that space, trying to create uh, expertise in uh, domain expertise in the space of innovation. And I want to say they've done that successfully. You know, you have uh, you also have emerging countries uh, in in Asia, India being one of them. And uh, many of you have spoken about. Um, you know, many of the intricate elements uh, that are proven so uh, coming up uh, in the past decade and moving forward in the next couple of decades. So uh, one cannot underestimate uh, what's taking place in India. Um, but also smaller countries like Singapore, Malaysia have done have done incredibly well uh, when it comes to dr driving innovation. Uh, Singapore in particular, you know, one of the top uh, 10, 20 countries uh, when it comes to innovation prosperity. But I, I think I think what's required, and uh, again, just uh, looking into what our, my colleagues are speaking about here, uh, what's expected uh, of the world uh, in the next in the next uh, decade or two, I would say um, innovation also needs to be taught to people. The process of innovation, you know, humans in, innately are very curious. And you know, it's like if if 
uh, you gentlemen can venture back when you were toddlers, kids, you know, how you learn through playing, through making mistakes, but having freedom of uh, leading with your curiosity, your mind uh, was was not structured, you know, it's like I got to get up at 7, eat breakfast by 7.15, do this, do that, and then um, that hampers innovation. That does not allow you to become, uh, to, to maintain your creativity. So at some point in our life, we, we put restrictions on our creative thinking. We put restriction on how we will lead the innovation process, and I think we need to break those boundaries moving forward. But when we when we speak of uh, Asia in particular, you know this is this is a continent with billions of people and billions of young people coming into foray. So they're in in order for them not to be um, part of uh, um, part of the human um, human uh, human uh, group. You know that that's going to be unemployed. That's going to be highly um, disadvantaged because they don't have uh, they don't have what it takes for them to meaningfully participate in uh, in the socioeconomic activities. I think it's very important for us to bring the process of innovation, and I want to emphasize on the term process of innovation because it. You know, I, I trust humans. I, I feel that curiosity will take uh, over if you enable that process of innovation for them, for us, uh, for us to go through that process and be able to uh, be creative enough for us to build our future, but also contribute positively to the rest of humanity. So I would say, you know, in Asia, you know, besides education, uh, besides automation, um, uh, including water issues, I think we really ought to look at how do we bring uh, the process of innovation into every individual's life for them to meaningfully contribute to their own prosperity, but uh, also those of us. Okay. Thank you, Armin. Uh, uh, I get to uh, Alec. Uh, uh, this is going to be a shorter round. It's about 9.17. We've got 13 minutes to go. So, uh, please be a little brief. So uh, in the first time you said that uh, we have to get past the denial and, and accept things and, you know, accept it in urgency and, and not deny it. Uh, some meaningful solutions that come to your mind considering where we are today. Oh, sure. Um, first of all, this is a very complex issue and definitely takes collective action. And that's not uh, easy anyways, but it's more than meaningful. It's necessary to achieve a brighter future. So from private sectors, what I've seen are uh, great activities combining uh, some of the things my colleague has mentioned, uh, things that combines innovation from the technological point of view to social innovation and traditional business models. Just for example, one uh, specific example in Asia, there are companies building these um, communities of affordable housing, for example, combining uh, technologies that are uh, more streamlined uh, uh, building processes and integrating green technology. So the uh, communities operate on a smaller carbon footprint, yet benefiting a number of um, population that are typically excluded from market participation. And there are also innovation, social innovation components where um, where there are algorithms to promote resource sharing and even jobs allocation to provide additional benefits. But those um, are, and uh, among many other things, but those alone are great examples, but not enough because we need uh, policy level support to transition to a greener economy, a more uh, equitable growth model. We have to see where we spend our public um, uh, funds to promote uh, things that would actually benefit everyday people's well-being instead of only pursuing economic growth as a number. And that is a very uh, important factor. Also, we need a grassroots, uh, grassroots efforts to raise awareness of the various people, uh, various issues we have on hand. So consumers, for example, can be more conscientious about what their spending habit would support. And, uh, uh, and like this in many directions, government, private, and the uh, individual level. So that's a shortened answer to how we can reach a better Thank outcome. You. 
Thank you, Alec. So, uh, back to Parag, you. Uh, uh, again, a trillion dollar question is about joblessness. You know, and, and you know that's what we are seeing the carnage as it plays out in each of these sectors, in each of these countries. So, what is the role of the social sector around joblessness? Because it's not uh, an issue of India, Asia, but the world. And how do we really handle this seriously, looking in the bullseye? There is a lot of carnage out there. So, you know, I absolutely believe that the social sector can lead the charge as far as addressing the joblessness of the world, as far as that is concerned. Uh, it's it's not just about joblessness by itself, but the problem just got more aggravated with reverse migration. So a lot of people have actually been displaced and and they've gone back to... To, uh, to environments where they've never worked before. It's very important to understand this. You know, you take you've, the people from urban, uh, the urban part of the world have gone back into what I call the semi-urban or rural part of the world. And suddenly they need to be, they need to be given a, a gainful income opportunity. And how do you do that? And then there are the, there are problems that of, of drinking water, sanitation, and so many other social sector major problems. And I'm sorry, uh, I do I I only speak from the social sector side, but so there are every other industry, every other factory, everybody must look at this problem very very holistically and in the in the right context. And therefore, it is important to stimulate local economies, very very local economies, by harnessing this uh, this capacity of HR that has gone back. These are the bread earners. These are people who are willing to work there and they, you know, they have a drive and that if channelized correctly can actually create a economic stimulus bottom up rather than top down. Okay. Thank you. For our, uh, Professor Ivan, I missed out on a question to you and that is that uh, since we are talking Asia and you're so specialized in Asia, what are the challenges, uh, as you say, Asia is in its lowest uh, point at this point? Uh, the challenge now, but what we're going to look at the challenge in the coming decade is, is also an important part they cannot ignore right now. Well, uh, we, we have got used to the expansion of Asia's middle class. Rapid expansion of middle class was one of the major driving forces of Asian economic growth and global economic growth. Let us be frank. The trend has reversed. Right now we see the squeeze of the middle class. Growing number of households moving down from the middle class to the low income strata. And within this low income strata, more and more people slid into extreme poverty. According to some estimates, about 20 million people may slid to, slid to extreme poverty due to COVID effect. So, what can be done about it? How can this process, how can this issue be addressed? What the governments can do, what the businesses can do. How to just prevent this squeeze of the middle class and uh, the termination of the development process. That is the COVID-related issue that is becoming more and more important right now. Also, as far as employment is concerned, as far as digitalization is concerned, my view is that as time goes by, more and more Asian countries will think about not maximizing the degree of digitalization or automation, but optimizing it optimizing and taking into account the employment issue. Don't go to the extreme, don't go to the maximum. Retain, retain employment and manual labor at the expense of automation when it is necessary for social stability and economic development. Let me stop here. Thank you, Professor. I think that's a very important point you brought out that in Asia, because of such a large workforce, we need to have stability, sustainability in our society, and not everything can be viewed from just technology perspective because governments have to run. They cannot have a civil order, uh, uh, strife everywhere. And so we need to optimize and not just maximize. Good point. Uh, uh, 
very quickly, uh, Professor, since I'm with you, I don't want to get back again with this last question of uh, one minute. Um, maybe uh, your closing remarks and all that you see today about uh, what businesses can as well do or governments can do under the circumstance. If you can do a closing remark on that a minute. Yeah, and right. I get back to three, points, three points. First, well, COVID creates some new business opportunities. We have to admit that. First of all, home, everybody's home is becoming a more and more important life stage. People are doing at home more and more things they used to do outside. Home is becoming an office, a restaurant, a concert, a fitness center, etc., etc. So, catch this demand. I'm not happy with this trend at all. It's abnormal, but that's the case. A short example, bread makers are selling very well in Japan today because Japanese people want to make good cakes at home. Second, I foresee a rise in the migration from big cities to smaller cities and towns, which are safer. Safer. So, in these smaller cities and towns, you have to create you have to create infrastructure facilities, build supermarkets, entertainment centers, etc., etc. This also may create a demand. And finally, a big talk. A big talk. This is the issue for the governments. It can and uh, should do more to support more in the and ancient governments can do more to foster and regional integration. RCEP, the signing of RCEP is a helpful sign in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Quickly, uh, I will ask Pranav for just a one minute quick roundup of all the job security and the future. Are we ready for the workforce of the future? Just a minute and then we'll get to two other panelists. Sure, sure. So uh, I'll just sort of sign off by saying three sort of three areas of uh, moving forward here. I think one, I completely agree with uh, Armen on revamping education sector. I think we are in a very old mindset thing, very linear. I think that has to go out. Uh, second one is more internal. I think a mentality change because we've always thought careers and professions as a ladder. But I read a nice article where it's not a ladder, but it's a lattice. So you can move across the matrix and you know really get a string of experiences. So it's an internal mindset shift of the people, the workforce themselves, not looking at a ladder, but looking at a lattice. And number three, I, I, I really want to emphasize this, is the disruptive reskilling. So disruptive reskilling means that it's not incremental in the sense that if you're a good engineer, you don't get another two, three programming languages on top of it. But anybody across the sector can he be or she be reskilled and retooled for the future. So those three things, I think, would be the big buckets of uh, you know, ideation for moving forward. Thank you, uh, Pranav. I'll go to uh, The last question, are you last thoughts on this? What would be your advice to emergent entrepreneurs who are ready and eager to tackle the global issues? And, and, and what is the journey from innovation to commercialization in these tough times? Uh, just a quick one minute on that, please. I think science is important. I think anyone that wants to go into entrepreneurship, I would um, highly recommend to look at scientific base uh, for whatever it is that you're working and building so that you would have a longevity associated with the business that you will be starting. Learn mathematics. I think that's very important because AI is, is so prevalent. It's in every sector, in every discipline, um, in, in every industry. So knowing mathematics, knowing, uh, knowing a lot about data sciences is going to be critical moving forward for any entrepreneur. Otherwise, AI will replace you. I promise you, AI will rep replace you. So you would want to position yourself to be as a partner with artificial intelligence rather than going at it uh, going at it on your own. Okay. Thank you, Armin. Thank you. Closing remarks by uh, California Fred. Go ahead. Well, just to quickly summarize, uh, I want to go back to the point of mentality. Whether we're choosing a uh, shift in corporate agenda or policy making changes, we do need to put a heavier focus on the type of reciprocal obligations we should be having with our environment, with people of other communities, and with our future generations, just so 
uh, we don't base on our profit and benefit on uh, leaving our children with deteriorating living conditions or um, exploitation of workers in uh, other communities, for example. So um, that would be my main takeaway. So the political friction, uh, the mentality towards our established uh, lifestyle and our ignorance towards problems farther away or further down the line don't continue to become the main impediments towards uh, making fundamental changes. Thank you, Alec, and, and thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we just uh, finished a great conversation on time. Uh, thank you for the articulate way you shared your thoughts and we were able to manage this. Stay safe, stay well, and I'm sure there'll be many other platforms will come together. I'm going to carry a lot of these nuggets that you have. There are a lot of people out here. Uh, 